I am Ed Nersessian, uh, Francis Levy and I are co-directors of the center. Uh, what you have been watching is called Dead or Alive. It's a film that is the work of Jane McAdam Freud, who is sitting here. And it will be shown again at the New York Psychoanalytic Institute on the 20th of March in the auditorium downstairs. And it's uh, free of charge. Uh, tonight's round table is on is Freud dead, the relevance of Freud's theory of group psychology in today's world. And it precedes another program on Freud, which is Freud's psychoanalysis and the Philipson Bible, which explains uh, the art, the display on the walls and uh, there. And uh, that was curated by Andrew, Andrew Raftery, who is a professor at the Rhode Island School of Design and who will be also uh, participating at the round table tomorrow, moderated by uh, Diane O'Donoghue. Uh, you can go to the website, philoctadis.org, and all of our future programs are listed, I believe, until about May or June. Uh, I'd like to welcome Mark. We had to wait that he finishes his time on a boat That's it. to be here. He is the Daniels Family Distinguished Teaching Professor of Romantic Poetry and Literary Theory at the University of Virginia. And he's the author of Why Read, Teacher, and Towards, and, and towards Reading Freud, Self-Creation in Milton, Wordsworth, Emerson, and Sigmund Freud. He's currently working on a book entitled The Death of Sigmund Freud. I thought that was already published, no? Yeah, that was published. I have a copy of it that oh. you sent me. Yeah. <laughs> this must be an old... Uh, anyhow, his latest book is The Death of Sigmund Freud. So that's it. Thank you. I'm just really pleased and honored to be here. Um, it's just it's simply a wonderful place, and I see the doings of the, the center from afar and uh, feel a great gratitude and admiration for Ed and for Francis for what they put together. It, uh, uh, it's a, a society devoted, I guess, to the study of the imagination and uh, in its selection of topics and uh, its approach to various intellectual matters, it is uh, a surpassing instance of the imagination, too. So I feel very proud and grateful to be um, uh, involved in it in, uh, in, in any way. Um, and, uh, Delighted to be here. This is my third time here, and uh, again, uh, thank you so much. Um, our topic tonight is Freud Dead, the relevance of Freud's theory of group psychology in today's world. Um, I'll introduce our um, distinguished panelists, whom I'm delighted to have had the chance to meet here, uh, and then uh, tell a couple of stories, and then uh, let them uh, talk to you about all the stuff that uh, they know and have been pondering about on this particular uh, subject. Um, with us today, and you kind of raise your hand when I say say who you are, is uh, Ken Isold. Ken is a, is a practicing psychoanalyst and organizational consultant. He's a past president of the International Society for the Psychoanalytic Study of Organizations and a former director of the organizational program at the William Allenson White Institute, where he currently teaches, supervises, and serves as chair of the fellows. Jim Hopkins. Jim is right here, has been a lecturer in philosophy at uh, Lincoln's College, Oxford, fellow and director of studies at King's College, Cambridge, reader in philosophy at King's College, London, and co advising professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, together with the noted um, uh, philosopher and scholar Richard Valheim, he edited philosophical essays on Freud, recently reprinted by Cambridge University Press. Um, Bennett Markle, um, here, uh, is a practicing psychoanalyst in Berkeley, California, a longtime interest in groups and group psychology. He studied English literature as an undergraduate at Yale in the 1950s at the height of the new criticism, which treated literary works in the way a psychoanalyst might approach a patient. Um, last but far from least is Jane McAdam Freud, who is a multidisciplinary artist working in the medium of 2D, 3D, and 4D encompassing drawing, sculpture, and film. She is, as you might know, the daughter of Lucian Freud and the great granddaughter of Sigmund Freud. Um, McAdam Freud studied at the Central School, um, Central St. Martins, and the Royal College of Art in London, and also won the British Art Medal Scholarship in Rome, 
where she proceeded to study sculpture for three years. She asked me to note that um, uh, the study of groups and the psychoanalytic approach to the study of groups was integral to her art uh, work uh, as is uh, ongoing. Um, let me just say a couple of uh, uh, introductory words um, and then uh, tell a story and ask a question of our panelists, which as good panelists, I trust they'll ignore, at least for a while, but maybe eventually they'll come back to it and kind of answer it for me because it's a question that involves my hopes for the republic and the United States and democracy and all that stuff, and I kind of don't know the answer. Um, first, uh, just to kind of set the stage a little bit, um, <coughs> I'll say this, um, in 1914, uh, something or other happened to Sigmund Freud. Um, suddenly, his interest shifted. One might say that between the year 1900 and 1914, between the publication of The Interpretation of Dreams and the publication of On Narcissism, Freud had, to speak very, very broadly, been interested in the subject of desire. Beginning in 1914, well, Freud never stopped being interested in desire, but he became interested in something else. He became interested in the issue of authority. In a paper published in that year on narcissism and introduction, Freud, in a very offhanded way, introduces a new entity in the psyche, the uber ich or the over-I. One had not heard of it before. Freud's perception of the psyche up until that point, as I understand it at least, had been dual. There's the I and there's the it. Now there's the I, the it, and the over-I, which was an agency of authority, sometimes acting unconsciously, often acting punitively, sometimes to the point of sadistically. Freud's interest in authority in the practical realm also became more developed. It was about that point, I believe, that his break with Jung became irretrievable. The crown prince of psychoanalysis was no longer the crown prince of psychoanalysis, and Freud had to do some pretty serious thinking about who was going to carry his endeavor on into the future. It ended up, of course, most honorably, being Anna Freud. Freud also published in that year, 1914, a very strange and for him strangely issued paper, in that it was anonymous, on the Moses of Michelangelo. In that brilliant reflection on the Moses statue, he reflects on, well, or what would you expect, the peculiar authority of Moses. And he says so many things that are so radically counterintuitive and brilliant about that statue that we sometimes wonder if he's not talking about himself and his own authority. Something else happens on the subject of authority around 1914 with Freud, and that is that he begins to change the mode of psychoanalysis that he practices. He seems to get a little bit less interested in dream interpretation, a little bit less interested in free association, and a little bit more interested in what he begins to call obitragung, the transference. The transference of feelings, thoughts, emotions onto the person of the physician. The physician who is sitting, as you remember, invisibly behind the couch becomes the objective of analysis. What kinds of feelings does the physician provoke? What kinds of fantasies of eros or what kinds of fantasies of authority does the physician provoke? The interest now in authority has many, many dimensions. Theoretical, the 1914 paper. Practical, who's going to succeed me? It's not going to be Jung. Therapeutic, we're going to start conducting therapy in a different way. This is a remarkably productive turn for uh, Freud. And it enables him, in the work that goes from 1914 right till his death in 1939, to start thinking not just about eros, but about eros and authority. And in an explosive array of works, he becomes what he always wished to be. He confides to a friend once in an early letter, I wanted to be a philosopher like Diderot or Voltaire. And I wanted to reflect on all of the really big human questions on government and ethics and the afterlife, such as it may have been. Everything of any kind of consequence I wanted to touch upon. And beginning with these thoughts about the overi, Freud starts to think about authority within the individual, but also in culture at large. He writes group psychology and the analysis of the ego, where he reflects on leaders and on politics. He writes civilization and its discontents, where he talks not just about the individual overi, but about the cultural overi as well. Suddenly, and for 25 years, Freud is talking about eros and authority. 
One of the things that occurs to me in thinking about Freud in this period, and maybe my uh, co-panelists will agree and maybe not, um, is uh, that, um, how to put this? I'm sorry, I, left, I lost the thought, I have to let it go. Um, but in any event, this is a, tr a tremendously, tremendously productive period um, for Freud in which he does some of his most um, absolutely remarkable work. Oh, the thought comes back. Um, and <laughs> thank you, Freud. Uh, and that is that. Um, thank you, brain. <laughs> or what is left thereof. Uh, that is that um, the hypothesis seems to me a live one that we might have assimilated a good deal of what Freud has to say about desire and its resistances between 1900 and 1914, but the possibility exists that culture still has not turned to Freud fully as a theorist of civilization and authority, the way we choose our leaders and are chosen by our leaders. There may be much more to learn there, and tonight we'll see if that may in fact be a possibility. Now, with that as an introduction, let me ask a question, and then, assuming that I can get to the end of the question, God knows, <laughs> um, and then step off the stage for a minute and let our guests and experts take over. Um, as you know, Sigmund Freud was, as he sometimes characterized himself, pretty good, hating, uh, pretty good at hating things. He described himself as a rather good hater. I was a contentious individual and took pride in it. He hated many things, anti-Semites, the mayor of Vienna, the whole business. But one of the things he hated more than anything else in the entire world was the United States of America. <laughs> he came and visited us in uh, 1909, about 99 years ago, just a couple of weeks um, back. Um, and he came with all kinds of predispositions. He didn't like us a single bit. He thought we were addicted to money. He said that we were all afflicted with dollaria. Um, he said that we had no culture whatsoever. He said that we were unable to be responsive to individuals of the leader type, the genuine leader type by which he meant himself, I suppose. <laughs> he even said at one really illuminating point that even American love affairs struck him as particularly shallow and pathetic. And the reason for this, I suspect, is because we were in such a hurry to make money that we couldn't activate any kind of Oedipal intensities in our love affairs and just skim from place to place and person to person in an entirely you know, insufficiently cathected and insufficiently interesting way for him. Um, his great fear, I suppose, about most cultures politically was that they would go in one of two directions. In the direction of rank authoritarianism, which so sadly he saw in the last couple of years of his life with the invasion of Austria by Hitler. This is simply a horrible thing. Everything he predicted, as it were, about our worst political tendencies in group psychology, at least from my perspective, uh, came true. But at least in regard to America, he was just as concerned about something that he called, perhaps with America in mind, the psychological poverty of groups, the psychological poverty of groups. Individuals who can't choose a rational leader become an utter rabblement, right? Something like de Tocqueville is Freud's critique, but it's much more ferocious and much more demeaning. They have no functioning ego ideals. They have no ideals at all you know, the best lack all conviction and the worst are everywhere, and they have their way. The tyranny of the majority is where it all is. Um, Freud probably feared tyranny by one individual in America, but more than that, Freud feared because of our radical commitment to democracy, and though he was a political liberal, he was not anything that you would call a, um, uh, a populist in the John Dewey sense, he feared that we would devolve into anarchy, and he feared that the only thing that stopped us from devolving into anarchy was our hunger for making money, which kept us busy with uh, other things. I'm painting it a little bit garishly, but I think there is truth in it. You couldn't mention the word America to Freud without his becoming um, apoplectic. Um, I wonder then, I wonder then what if Freud were called back from Wherever it is, he is. Somewhere, I suspect. I hope. He's in this building. Is it? <laughs> Upstairs or down? Um, um, that, um, 
uh, uh, you know, there would be many questions one would want to ask him. There's that beautiful line of Auden's in the Elegy where he says, you know, he died with all these questions still unanswered or around him. And there are so many of them. The question of homosexuality, the question of sublimation, the question of the counter-transference, the question of female sexuality. But one question one would like to ask him, if, if it were me, was, how do you like us now? <laughs> Barack Obama just became president of the United States. I don't see an authoritarian there, though it's early in the game. I don't see a representative of the rabblement there. I see what I think you'd have to call an reasonable, thoughtful, analytical, highly detached, articulate, though I have to admit I do do a little bit of sleeping when I read his memoir, <laughs> sorry, uh, individual of the leader type in the best sense. How do you like us now, Dr. Freud? Did we prove you wrong or did we not? Anyway, let me leave it there. I have other questions that our panelists can happily choose to ignore or not. Um, but um, that seems to me to be one gateway into thinking about Freud and the question of political thought and Freud and the question of authority and uh, democracy. Thanks for bearing with my mental lapse. There will be more of those to come. Um, shall we start here? Do you want to just do a little talking in any direction you choose? Well, I knew we were going to be asked this question, and I said I was going to pull a stare at the and, uh, uh, But now that I heard the question, I... I I would like to answer it and say that if Freud reappeared today, he'd said, it's worse than I thought. <laughs> and you guys were really lucky. And, um, uh, and not only and my reading that, I, know, I didn't know, you know everything he said about being in America, but uh, I can imagine he was equally worried about the fate of psychoanalysis in America. And he said, that has far surpassed my worst fears. But I'm not going to go into that, because that is really a lecture. Uh, and uh, so that's what I think Freud would have had to say. Okay. Um, do you want to ask the rest of the panelists? Do you want me to just? Sure. Said, oh gosh, I was right. You've lurched from one extreme to the other, you know, from Bush to Obama, um, and he, he really thought that these two things went hand in hand, you know, one, one thing uh, in an extreme was exactly the same as the other. Um, I don't mean that in a negative way, but I do feel that that is a big lurch of uh, a temperament uh, from the American people to have elected in Bush and then to, elect, to have elected in Obama. I think uh, I'd like to pass it on at that point. To you or you? <laughs> well, it might be worth reflecting on uh, what the shift is, uh, because it is an important shift in Freudian terms. And we can hope that the shift uh, remains more than a shift. But Freud thought uh, of groups as uh, both um, related to two mechanisms, as related to the mechanism, as bound together by mechanisms of identification and as set at odds by mechanisms of projection. Uh, with Sarah Palin, Sarah Palin did a beautiful thing on this when she was asked about the Republican Party. Uh, she said she would step through the door which God might indicate to her if it was right for her family, her city, her state, and her nation. And in that she picked up brilliantly on the same hierarchy and groups that you get in the old uh, proverb, my brother against my brother, my, myself against my brother, my brother and I against the family, the family against the clan, all of us mm -hmm. against the foreigner. That is, the, we have these groups. She was taking them as identified by, related by identification, the primary groups on through the hierarchy. Uh, the proverb takes them as disunited, as related by projection at first, the relation of enmity. Uh, and what Freud showed was that uh, you could take each of these groups and show how projection became dominated 
by identification because the hostility connected with projection led to guilt up through the nation where there was no mechanism by which the hostility promoted by projection fed back via identification into guilt. And uh, uh, what, what we've watched is the change between uh, a political shift in terms of which America was a fight, flight group. Uh, if we all watched, presumably, or were aware of the uh, uh, presidential conventions and debates when Bush was last elected, the extraordinary anger that was generated in the Republican National Convention, the attitude of national belligerence that mm -hmm. was present. Now, uh, that has shifted, and it shifted to a rhetoric of identification mm -hmm. with uh, the rest of the world. Now, whether that rhetoric can hold, given the power of these mechanisms, given the power of projection, uh, who, which is being stoked uh, even as we speak, which was very active. The attempt to stoke it in the campaign failed. But whether that kind of attempt will continue to fail, I think, hangs by a thread. So I think if Freud were here, he would at least uh, recognize that a better equilibrium, if a temporary one, has been reached than previously. And he would think, well, they have a chance to understand this in terms of things I've described. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let me come at this from a different angle. Um, because actually, I think what Freud said about America is a nasty, sort of intemperate, uh, unwarranted uh, judgment. Mm -hmm. uh, so an interesting question for me is, why did he arrive at that? I mean, we could find reasons and justifications you know, along those lines. And I'm perfectly happy to just to jump in and speculate about that. But my own pers favorite hypothesis is that he blamed America for Jung. <laughs> <laughs> he lost Jung, but Jung spent a lot of time in America. He came over to Chicago. He analyzed the McCormicks and so on and so forth. And so he betrayed psychoanalysis for the Americans. And they spent him a lot of money, which is particularly, I think, why one reason why he focused on America as money grubbing and money, you know, money hungry and so forth. But that's my own sort of personal interpretation for this really quite this lapse in Freud. I mean, I mean, I think of Freud as really a very, very subtle and intelligent, thoughtful person. But it's all his comments about America just don't have the earmarks of his usual thoughtfulness. Yes. So I don't want to take it at mm -hmm. face value. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to sort of interpret it, you know, try to explain it away in some way. But mm -hmm. certainly I don't. I'd like to say in this particular sense, perhaps, Freud has died. <laughs> Maybe we can sort of let this go, you know, and not continually worry or blame ourselves mm -hmm. for his intemperate judgments about us for whatever reasons he, he made them. Mm -hmm. So I have, I'll have i stop here. Okay. <laughs> let me, this is a great start. Let, let me ask you all a kind of brass tacks uh, question. Um, and, and it just goes like this. If um, the room were full of, and it may well be, uh, economists or political scientists or sociologists, I think one of the things that they would say is that to talk about politics in psychoanalytic terms is tantamount to, let us say generously, eccentricity. Politics is about <laughs> interests. Politics is about groups. Politics is about conscious desires, right? Um, so I'd like to ask you to think, if you will, about the strengths of Freud as a commentator on matters political and social, and also what his limitations might be. If, since you're here, you must at least be willing to entertain the serious possibility of his having something to say about um, uh, group behavior. Um, I wonder, as it were, when you start speaking Freud in regard to the way groups are behaving, and when you might stop speaking Freud in regard to the way groups are behaving. That may be leading the question a little bit too far, but you know, what, what value and what limit to Freud on the matter of politics and larger cultural issues. Well, I, I, I don't have to follow the same order. No, just you can just, just jump in. Go crazy. Somebody, 
Well, I, 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 you know, I, I have something to say about it. In a way, I, I am going to go do a, a, a palin thing on this, but I do want to tell you that I disagree completely with you. Good. I think he smelled a rat the same way that de Tocqueville did, and that he was a, uh, he was, he, he took one of his prejudices and he stuck it here, where it actually belonged. And uh, I, the thing about Jung, I'm very interested in that, but I think Freud is a, I, I'm going to go on to some of the remarks that I have in, in this work, I mean, uh, and for some reason which might be mistaken, I sort of assumed that everybody would be familiar with what's in the group psychology book. And so I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you what's in it, uh, assuming that you know, although maybe it, it, it'll appear uh, here, but as a, as a, uh, as a work, and, as a, and by the way, when you do that, this is a very interesting book. This is a commentary put out by the International Psychoanalytic Organization in 2001 that uh, works its way through the, uh, the uh, meanings and, the, uh, and some of the things that are in the book. And so I would recommend that book along with the group psychology book. Um, and um, in reviewing the material myself for this meeting, uh, I realized, which I knew, that it had been remarkably fresh in my mind for 40 or 50 years. And uh, I'm really struck by the fact that Freud wrote it at all. And, and, and feel, as, as commentators have, that it falls into the class of civilization and its discontents, the future of an illusion, I, I, uh, Moses and monotheism, works that, are, that, that do what he said he wanted to do and that have uh, very little to do with the uh, examining room of a psychoanalyst, but are historical, uh, that are historical works. Uh, this has been noted by people, so uh, uh, that, this isn't a fresh idea with me. Uh, and the, uh, the, the society here originally invited uh, Neil Smeltzer, who's a, uh, a very, very eminent sociologist and a psychoanalyst, and has written in both fields, is still writing, and uh, uh, to, uh, to do this job. And uh, he passed it on to me. Uh, and I'm really a, uh, I'm a clinician. I just sit in my office seeing patients all day. And um, so, uh, but in any case, it's, but in any case, he, here I am. And, uh, um, that was very wise of the society to invite Neil, actually. He would have done a very good job. Uh, I, uh, but I myself have an incredible amount of material about this subject. But I want to confine myself to my own bottom line. Uh, so at least I get said what I'd like to say. Uh, we, the, the, the question you ask is a very hard one to approach because we have lived through our own time, which uh, Freud did not have the advantage of doing. And uh, the Americans that are here, and the Americans my age, would have lived through that, that the historical time that goes back before uh, Roosevelt. And, uh, and we really know incredibly more about groups, masses, mobs, herds, hordes <laughs> than Freud could ever know, really. He was dealing with matters from a theoretical point of view. And, uh, and it seemed to me that the first mob scene that he might have experienced was Hitler's Anschluss into Austria. Uh, otherwise, I don't know what he was looking at. But somehow he evolved this really quite wonderful material. Uh, I, I mean, I, I wanted to point out about what we ourselves had experienced, what Hitler himself would experience, he, what uh, Freud himself would have experienced. He experienced the Anschluss, but this is after the paper. He experienced Auschwitz. Uh, 
he didn't experience it, but it was going on, which was a kind of mob scene. It was a mob scene for many of the movies that we've seen. And uh, we ourselves, during our lifetime, have experienced marches, mobs, sit-ins, which is really what he was writing about. Uh, one of the right, he, what he was writing about, and this appears, you know, as this was, Ma, I don't speak German, but the title had Maasen in it, which had a whole series of definitions, none of which included group. And, uh, but he was aware of the translation, and uh, he, liked, he liked group. But I'm, I'm back to what we've experienced. I mean, in New York, there have been students in Columbia. We've had Kent State. We've had riots in Detroit, in Watts. In, we've had peace marches for and against abortion. We've, we've, had, we've seen lots of mobs that he didn't have the opportunity to see. And um, I'm leaving so out. Saying, had he seen them, he would have changed his views? Mm -hmm. Oh or no! Do you think his views are still applicable to understanding well, I think, those? Uh, yes, I think his views are very applicable, and he may have had the same views, knowing Freud. Uh, he would have uh, sort of stuck to the Oedipus complex and the leader and the so on and so on. He, he, I, I believe he would have stuck to his own. I, I don't know what he would have done, and I consider that sort of an unfair question. <laughs> um, but let, let, let's leap in the direction of some of our colleagues and see where they are on this matter. Well, I, um, I think, uh, I mean, I think this odd position of being more Freudian than the Freudians, maybe. I think his ideas about group psychology are right. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we had better get on top of them at our peril, because we're at most in a breathing space, uh, if unless we destroy ourselves by war, uh, we will, through the growth of our populations, which seems absolutely inevitable, we will render resources more and more scarce, and therefore continually recreate uh, the uh, conditions that create conflict among individuals in a society, which is then resolved by upping the level, uh, having conflict at a different level, which then unites the society. We'll su we've seen that countless times. We'll see it again at an accelerated pace. I think we're at a breathing space in that process now. And uh, so Freud's ideas are more important than ever in enabling humanity as a whole to come to grips with this. I think they have a particular limitation which is connected with this, which is that it's hard to make them scientifically plausible. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in a way, they're open to observation at the level that we're interested in. It was clear that when Bush said, we are good, they are evil, a projection had been effected which uh, made it no longer relevant to worry about the suffering that we might impose on those uh, at whom our belligerence was aimed and so forth. And I don't think it's hard to see that something like that happened. I think we can, the, the, in a way, the irrationalities of groups are so much more evident, except when you're caught up with them, than the irrationalities of individuals. Nonetheless, it's hard to make scientific. Mm. But I think that's starting to happen, um, partly in connection with neuropsychoanalysis, which uh, um, I'm very grateful is being so strongly supported here. Uh, the uh, psychoanalysis, uh, the neuroscience of identification is proceeding apace <laughs> with the discovery of mirror systems and uh, the, um, all kinds of the actual mechanisms of identification. The neuroscience of projection is in embryo. I mean, uh, there was a, there's a lot of work in social neuroscience now. There was a result just recently that we we think with a different part of our brains when we think about those with whom we're not identified, mm. for example. So I think a combination of clarity on the part of advocates of these ideas and integration with science may help us to understand, may help us to promulgate them more. But I think that uh, uh, 
not uh, in the sense in which he's alive. We need him now more than ever. It's beautiful. Yeah, I, I think that, um, I mean, Freud, surely Freud would have thought that he would be delighted that in New York people are so Freudian. They love him. I think it's just that he would have... Uh, how could he fail not to like that? He hated Americans and New Yorkers love him. I mean, he would have loved that. He didn't that. like being liked. <laughs> he, he may not have liked being liked on one level, but on the other level, he would have loved being. He would have hated and loved it. But you might know better than the rest of us. <laughs> he, he said to himself, the two sides of this, this coin. And also, educationally, surely, we, surely he would have advocated some sort of psychological self awareness at a very young age. Mm -hmm. But that it wasn't such a taboo that we were only um, hiding uh, the fact we were in analysis or not, rather than advocating it for children from a very young age so that we could at least um, give them the potential of having some sort of tool with which to vote, to judge whether a leader was, uh, had good mental health or not, <laughs> or, or was at least intelligent, <laughs> no, or had an integrity. You know, I mean... I think he, he might have thought just a multidisciplinary approach would be the way forward, just as the multicultural way forward has, uh, has gained us this wonderful uh, Obama. You know, multiculturalism has succeeded. All the disciplines together, that could succeed. You know, political science, economic science, psychological science, all pooling in together rather than psychology being ignored and kept as a taboo. I think the whole thing that lid needs lifting off and um, we've all got to admit our insanity and our need for Freudian-based theory, all psychoanalysis roots back to Freud and it's a good thing to be aware. It can only be a good thing. Freud was a man, an old, an, a man like the rest of us, a person with all his faults. Of course he was. But he's given us something that we can really make good use of, and I'm really shocked that uh, it's still hidden by itself. It's very much hidden away as a subject on the educational um, prospectus and also on the political agenda. Why aren't these politicians being, um, in some way, uh, made answerable to some sort of agenda that has in it a psychological sort of... Uh, an open and public psychological profile that we can judge, is this person sane? Is he intelligent? <laughs> is he, has he got integrity? In which case, uh, we will or will not vote him in. And I, um, I love Americans. They voted in Obama. I'm still <laughs> in awe. I am in personally in awe on that note. Um, but thank I you, everyone. But I suppose you could say that it is a kind of a crapshoot in America. You know, who's going to end up being nominated who's going to end up being elected. And since there's no mediating of that process as there is in the UK and many other you know, European countries. But I have, as you could imagine, I have mixed feelings about Freud mm -hmm. uh, in this respect because I do think he raised a tremendously important question in, this, in his book on group psychology, mass psychology. I think you're quite right about that, uh, which is what is the link between the individual and the psyche of the individual and these kind of crazy mass phenomena that take place. They're so regressive, they're so uh, destructive, so potentially destructive. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think before that, I think we sort of tend to take it for granted that people became sort of irrational uh, in those sorts of settings. And there were a lot of settings in the French Revolution, for example, and in the revolutions of 1848 and all of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't think Freud was ignorant, you know, of yeah. the group phenomena that I mean, had occurred before that. Yeah. Well, I think around the first, the first World War and the disruptions after the war, the Bolshevik Revolution, the things that were going on in, in uh, Vienna and so forth, he had a, he, I, think he, I don't think any European was sort of untouched by that kind of group mass madness. Um, but I think he tried to figure out <clears throat> why, what was it about the individual psyche that made it so vulnerable to these sorts of processes. Mm. I think in that sense it was a little bit like a scientist who takes a compound and subjects it to great heat 
<coughs> or, or uh, great uh, stress, you know, to see how it reacts. It's as if the ego, under those sort of circumstances, acts differently. And what is it about it that's exposed when you look at it in that context? So I think, in a sense, it was quite audacious, if that's not an overused word, uh, of him to kind of pose that sort of question right, and, and try to look at it. What is, as his, he put it in the terms of, what's the gradient in the ego that makes it vulnerable to these sorts of processes and supports the fact that these kinds of things happen in, uh, in society? In groups, though, because everything changes in the individual when he's in a group. Absolutely. The right. lowest common So you take this ego and you put it in a group or in a mass actually yes. I think that's the more yes. accurate term here and then it's really quite different and it's stunning. It's anonymous. And group. I think we've seen a lot of that actually in the campaign. I mean people were so wrapped up in it, so intensely consumed by it uh, that you know in a sense clearly they were there was a kind of a madness that sort of mm -hmm. took over. They Their personal interests could not in, in any way possibly explain or justify the intensity of their consuming interest in the campaign. So what is that? What's going on there? I don't quite <coughs> buy the explanation he came up with. I mean, I don't think of it. I don't think his concept of the ego ideal being replaced by political leaders is an adequate explanation. I think of it more in terms of identity, that identity is a huge issue in groups and mass phenomena that then it helps to account for what drives people to, to, to react this way and feel that kind of hatred and on the one hand or that kind of enthusiasm and uh, uh, joy, you know, on the other. But, you know, be that as it may, I think he tr deserves a tremendous amount of credit for raising this question, you know, of what is it about us that accounts for these kind of epical, crazy processes that are so destructive and dangerous. Well, you, you take us in an interesting direction, and, and there's also the remark just recently that, you know, things have changed since Freud. Um, we've seen more than he has, if we can't claim to know more than he did. Um, but if, um, if you had group psychology to write an addendum to, uh, what should be added to it? What should be subtracted? What more would you like to put on to that text in order to make it because everybody in the room seems to think it illuminating. What, 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 do we, what do we need to make it yet more illuminating than it is? Or is it fine as is? Well, you know, I'd still like to get to my bottom line. <laughs> OK. Um, Here we stop. And, yeah. and, and I, I'd like to start by disagreeing with you Again. <laughs> about the destructiveness of these mobs and groups. And uh, one th they can be constructive. As well, and in the in the last campaign, we there was a group. Those were the group that then finally that was unformed, uh, that consolidated behind Obama. So it was very interesting. We had what I consider uh, will get me to my bottom line. We had an unformed, leaderless group that ended up behind Obama uh, by our good fortune and his too. Um, and, um, and, and now I'm back to Freud and his writing this as a historical work. And, and you're perfectly right. There were lots of shoot 'em ups in St. Petersburg and in Paris. And, um, and these were works uh, out tell, uh, that Freud refers to in uh, quote in his dealing with uh, Le Bon and McDougal and Trotter, they were people who had written works, and you can go and see what they had to say. And Freud, in a way, uh, sort of gave their arguments, paid them due respect, and then uh, trumped them, as it were, with the idea of a leader, a father figure that the hordes and the mobs and the groups followed. And then he refined that to an ego ideal, which was an ideal father. Well, I find that from our own standpoint, historically, we can say, which he didn't, that there are groups that follow 
no leader, leaderless groups that follow an idea, the idea of fair play, the idea of a reasonable division of the wealth, ideas out there that have no leader. Oh, it's a leading idea. It? It's a leading idea that has nobody attached to it, and nobody might ever get attached to it. And, um, and whether I mean, uh, uh, Freud, I, I don't know what he would have said. I mean, Freud was a stubborn man. He would have stuck to the leader and somehow squeezed that leader or that father figure in there. But I don't think that was correct. And I think there is, in fact, an idea. There is a group. There is something that these people are following. And that isn't the father. The mother, surprisingly, doesn't get mentioned at all here. But in these leaderless groups, there's a sense of a family of people. Um, and you have these mobs, groups, are bound together by the idea of a family. This is how I see it anyway, and how I experienced it rather recently. They are members of a family. And the libidinal part ends up being quite a wonderful word. Um, uh, in some of these, there was lots of struggle with libido. And libidinal, they are bound together by libidinal ties. These, these mobs or groups or political action places and they are very and they are very unique they're not like erotic ties in that well th what occurs to me is they don't disappear after a night uh, they just stay there in your mind but Bennett, you bring up in my mind the idea of fundamentalism right i mean that's what well, comes to my mind as leaderless groups people who are by, uh, bound together by a very powerful idea that they subscribe to. I think, again, you, you, one might argue that behind the fundamentalist belief is uh, the illusion or the projection of a god figure, in a sense, because it comes down from that. So they can't actually follow that figure because he's not moving. But you know, there is the Bible or the beliefs or the systems that are in, in present that they subscribe to. I don't find that reassuring. <laughs> what don't you find reassuring? Uh, these leaderless groups who believe have these fundamentalist beliefs that are so powerful that they bind people together to, in concerted actions. That was what bound our forefathers together, wasn't it? Uh, I mean, our American forefathers, I, they had an idea. I don't know why it discourages you. But they had plenty of leaders, too. Pardon? There are plenty of leaders too. In other words, it's one one thing for you to say there are these ideas and there are no leaders, but for any group to then form around them, usually there is going to be a leader. Mm -hmm. A leader emerges from the yeah. group, yes. Once Maybe. they are forming into a real group, this large group of you know number of people believing in the same idea is different than when they actually form a group. Right, and then you have useful and interesting ideas about what, how do you apply that idea in this particular circumstance or what does... I, I'm afraid I don't do you... quite follow that. I was involved in a political group quite recently that had no leader and no leader emerged and the group came and went. Uh, Why? Uh, because that no wasn't leader. fine. No, that's why, because no leader emerged. That's why the group came and went. <laughs> um, well, a leader came. Well, I'm not going to argue this into the ground. But, and, uh, but I did want, it was part of my general remarks, but I did want to get to my bottom line. <laughs> Are we stopping you again? There is no bottom line. <laughs> Um, just a, a remark about leaderless groups, that's maybe of some interest, is that um, the most moving and historically consequential example of this I know of uh, is Buddhism, where um, the Buddha came and preached and talked, and people addressed to him the question that it said is it has been addressed to only two people who have ever lived, Jesus Christ and the Buddha. People would come up to the Buddha and say, not who are you, but what are you? He was so extraordinary in his compassion and in his analytical power, his humanity, 
Um, and he would look them in the eye and say, I am a person just like you. Are you a god? No, I am not a god. When you ask Jesus if he was a god or not, you would get an answer to enigmatize the, enigma, the enigmatic. When you ask the Buddha, he'd look you in the nose and say, no, I'm not a god. I'm somebody who has found a way to live on this earth um, as satisfyingly as possible. I'm not a god. So, That's and what the know, Dalai Lama does, too. Right. So then the Buddha, the Buddha dies after 40 years of teaching and preaching of, of not being a god. And now you traverse Southeast Asia, and everywhere you go, there's the sitting Buddha, the standing Buddha, the reclining <laughs> Buddha, the golden Buddha, the god <laughs> Buddha. Human beings, Freud would be delighted to say, apparently have a very strong need for this kind of a figure. And they took somebody who said, no, I'm not, and made him into a yes, I am, like it or not. <laughs> That's your point about authority. <laughs> well, that's one of them. I think, uh, if, I think there are um, uh, things that would be added and that uh, it would help to add nowadays to our sense of Freud's work on this. One is that there's something that has been in evolution all along and was in Darwin, and it's now been revived as a leading idea, yeah. uh, which is that an important part of our selective history may have involved group warfare. Darwin asked, how did human characteristics come about? And he said, because throughout history, tribes have supplanted other tribes, and that too is a form of natural selection. And uh, theoretical work has been done on this, and uh, work in evolutionary modeling, and so forth. And this now does appear a likely uh, part of the human story that we evolved through a process of cooperation in groups, the better to compete in groups. And this was actually the ratchet of civilization, that each time a group got better at competing, its mode of competition became universal because everybody else went to the wall, as we've seen in a way in our lifetime with European technology and so forth. And that then could filter back into the genes in a slow way, because people born into the new civilization, the genes of those that did better would do better there, like with the genes of people that could metabolize cow's milk and so on. So there's been this kind of cultural ratchet that's brought us to our fantastic ability to cooperate with one another, but the other side of that coin being a readiness to compete in groups with one another. Mm -hmm. This would also explain why we are so ferociously cooperative, uh, competitive in groups. And strangely enough, it would explain why we're the one animal that commits suicide. Because we attain our group cooperation by doing something which Freud noticed and which now can be combined with this Darwinian idea by turning aggression inward. We are animals who have learned, who have been bred to turn our aggression inward when we're in a group, to subs be subservient to the norms, ideas, leader, and so forth of the group. And that has uh, made the groups that were more able to do that more competitive. But that, of course, has meant that aggression has been turned outwards against other groups. So I think if one were to take this particular Darwinian perspective and add it to Freud's, it actually ties a lot together that Freud left untied. Freud came on the idea of the death instinct primarily because of the ferocious group aggression, but he also noticed the superego, as he put it, was a reservoir of the death instinct. Well, that's because the superego is the mechanism of keeping people locked in these groups, which can then turn their aggression outwards. D does Freud accept your, your, your emendation, or is he, is he arguing? <laughs> what do you think? I very much would like to talk to him about that. Yeah. But <laughs> well, well, any minute. Now. Well, let me represent him. <laughs> uh, you know, you use cooperative when you wanted to say competitive. Mm -hmm. And you made a genuine Freudian slip. Could be. In my, in my book, that has to do with Darwinianism. Altruism also seems to be a part of our human inheritance. And, uh, and, and I mean, I'm not really a student of anything much. Uh, but there are pictures of 
monkeys learning to drink through straws and sharing the straws and so on, where altruism is a part of our human endowment. And so if you think in terms of a bell-shaped curve, on one end, our genetic endowment is a competitive as the way that way and the next. And the other end of the bell-shaped curve is altruism and cooperativeness. And I don't know what Freud would say, but I know what I feel. I know what Darwin would say uh, that these are these are features of survival. So there are other features of survival other than going to war. And um, well, I just but, wanted to point out the Freudian slips. Since that's all. Let, <laughs> let me living. break in because I think Jim, you were making a complex point where the two are interrelated with each other. If I understood, which is that societies or groups that have been able to cooperate with each other internally in order to be more competitive externally with other groups were more likely to thrive and they were the ones who would succeed and so in the evolutionary process it was those societies that had learned those lessons who that were likely to dominate. Right. Yep. So there is something, some interplay between cooperation in the service of co competition that really is, is, I think, the point that you're trying to make, which yes. I think is, uh, I mean, I suspect that something like that is probably true, that in the evolution of civilization, there was something that was learned on a group level, so to speak. Um, but I also I wanted to add, I had another point I wanted to add, which is that, and I referred to it earlier when I talked about um, identity. I think identity is a very critical issue in groups. And I see that, I think we see that a lot in all the ethnic conflicts, you know, in, in, in Africa and Europe and Asia, where people, in a sense, really go to war with each other. They, they don't even, even need a, particularly need strong leadership to do that, but something gets mobilized around the identity of a of a Hutsi or a Tutsi, you know, versus the others, they project onto each other and they sort of really go at it. Uh, I think the I think ident if you add identity, the issue of identity to groups, or particularly on a mass level, I think you have a very potent explanation for a lot of the violence that we experience. And I think a lot of that, in a sense, is drummed up in political campaigns or in wars uh, that are. Uh, motivated by economic issues and so forth, but I think that's very powerful. I think um, it's interesting, yes, what you're saying. I was thinking a bit about Freud, who spoke a lot about repression and the fact that as a society we continually repeat these futile wars. And it, it brings to, to mind, I think, Freud's words that if we repress, we repeat, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's one of the ways of uh, not to dealing with things. So they, go, they become dangerous. That was my first point, that unless we confront our repressed stuff as a society, then we will continually have war after war after war. There's nothing else we can do with that repressed stuff but than to scapegoat so one group shifting their staff onto another. The second point I wanted to make was something Freud said about, uh, to take an example, he had this thing about anti-Semitism. It wasn't up to the Jew to stand up for the Jew. It was up to the Christian to stand up for the Jew. So in that way, change is made, to take that example. Um, I think that would be one sort of political solution if politically this type of thing was happening. Which I'll give an example of that. In Britain, in times of uh, troubles, uh, a recession, uh, there's a lot of white supremacy, problems of white supremacy, lots of uh, aggression coming out, one group against another group all over the place, everyone shifting their stuff to the other. and. We had one guy, Trevor Phillips, he's, um, I think, a director for the Commission of Equal Opportunities there in Britain, black guy, African origin. He said, now, 
I am the commissioner for, uh, the, uh, for equal opportunities. I deal with ethnic minorities. I would like to make the uh, white poor uh, a minority group in need. He stood up and said, if we don't do this, we are, we are going to have a sort of backlash from these people. And him saying it struck a chord in me. I thought, has he read Freud? Does he realise the impact of what he's saying? Mm -hmm. This is quite a, a historic change that empathy is being shown on a political level. It smacked of <coughs> not the usual political um, stuff we get fed. Mm -hmm. Something really quite different. And I think it's those sort of solutions we ought to be looking towards. Different ways of uh, being told information, of uh, giving it a thinking of others the difficulty of thinking of others. And I think it, it's a very difficult subject, psychoanalysis, for, for the general public. And I think ways of entering into it might be through art, sensory experience through music or art. For example, sorry to go on, but <laughs> there was a student of mine who's, who was working from the model. So we have the life model. She's got a board of clay making a relief. She said, it's so difficult. It's so difficult to do this because it's so confusing. It's as though I'm working from a reflection. Everything's in reverse. I was fascinated and asked her to explain further. And she's really said, I just can't explain. It just feels impossible. And I realized she was having this experience of interiority. She was the mold for the model. You know, and... That experience of really finding how difficult it is to see another as separate from the self. Mm -hmm. You know, she was really staying inside herself and not able even to put this information down without self-reference. Her, the mould, you know, the negative and the positive, and the model, the other. And I thought that was a wonderful way maybe to, to bring psychoanalysis to the people without all the words, you know. We can hardly bring that to the individual psychoanalytic case. <laughs> <laughs> that is serious. I appreciate what you said. Uh, Thank you. Oh, I've left everyone dumbstruck. <laughs> <laughs> well, n never at a loss. Um, I, I guess um, one of the things that, that threads through your remarks, Jane, and is, is moving at least to me, but seems to be worth pursuing in a question, is kind of stems from Freud's great quote, where, where it was, their ego shall be. Mm. The idea that the, by virtue of articulation and awareness, we can effectively change our behavior. Um, and that always strikes me as a question, particularly after I've met after I run into somebody who's you know done ten years of analysis and where it was uh, you know articulation is, but they're still doing the same damn thing over and over again. <laughs> um, and so I wonder if you just if anybody felt like brooding on the value of um, psychoanalysis as a form of education and as a form of transforming therapy, in which. Um, there's the assumption that almost inevitably articulation results in a transformation of consciousness. Uh, in my experience, that's not always the case. Mm. Well, I didn't mean to be snide. And, and, and no. in, in response to both your questions or statements, we're interested. We're talking about teaching people to be more empathetic. And um, anybody in the audience, I'd be interested to hear about how you go about doing that one. Uh, and that's not very easy. No, but that was one suggestion through art, through music, through other disciplines that aren't necessarily um, verbal. Well, verbal. Okay. But the example you gave was of a political leader, or at least a government leader, who said, let's change our policies, really rather than think of them as competing groups, let's think of them as groups who have the same issues that we yeah, have, right? Yeah. So it's, I, I, I would say there's probably a multiplicity of ways in which empath empathy or identification can be promoted, just as there are probably a multiplicity of ways in which people can change. I'd like yeah. to hear one of them. But certainly art well, is one of them, where it, uh, anything that allows people to present themselves as fully human in a way that can resonate to other people promotes this. Uh, but it's it's curious how ready we are to shut down when the wrong people are doing it. 
but also how art provides a kind of wedge. I mean, Barack Obama wouldn't have been possible without the fantastic cultural uh, um, contribution that Afro-Americans made for a long time. It was through art that Yes, Afro-Americans exactly. yes, entered the national culture yes, as yes. full human beings. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, then that, oddly enough, mutated through sports mm -hmm. and then finally through politics. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, art was the very leading edge there. Very interesting, very interesting. You know, yes. I agree with that and completely disagree with it <laughs> at the same time. And um, I... I have a lot of experience with arts groups. I was at the opera last night. It could have been politically transforming. I think in general, people come in to and see a work of art and go out, and they are exactly the same people. And uh, or they they come into a psychoanalytic session, come in and go out, and are exactly the same person. So. Um, the the transformational power of art, it's there, uh, but, uh, you know, Goya, Manet, they were, they had it all down there. We're hundreds of years down the road now. If we're waiting on art, we're in for annihilation. That's the way I see it anyway. No, I think that's a pity you see it like that. Great pity. And... Uh... I hold I'm out all for art. Hope. For humanity, I I'm hold all out for more, art. More it, is, it is worth saying that we're, <laughs> one of the things that is hopeful and that uh, the Obama campaign illustrated mm -hmm. is that we now have means of communication that are much more diverse and open. Uh, and people are, for better or for worse, much more engaged with them mm. than they ever were previously in human history. Yeah, I agree with I completely. Mean, uh, and that may be... That may be, that, I think that played a very, I think even like YouTube played an important role it, in this campaign. It was a new art yeah, form. It, yeah. it was and, a new art form, really. And That's the way I see it anyway. It, it's, if, if, we, if there were lots and lots of Iranian people within visual link of American people, exchanging information about their feelings and lives, it would be much harder for our politicians to promote the idea that the next thing we must do is bomb them in order that they don't get weapons like ours. Well, I that mean, they are the devils or the enemy. Uh, or... So I think there, there, there may be kind of a, a real change here that uh, can give communication more power and with it art. But, but I think Jane, Jane, you made a very interesting point there about them bringing up this political leader because I think in, in some senses the empathy you were talking about comes in the creation of the sense of an, of, of an other against who we all unite. That it, it's a paradox of the whole. I mean, I don't think the Freud would discount this paradox. Mm -hmm. And that the fact, the fact is that what you are, that the political leader who brings up this particular solution to the problem uh, is it presents a rather unsettling phenomenon in which you, you don't have a lot of group cohesion and another type of group, you know, kind of... Mm, uh, they're you supporting know. the wrong group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So wrong it, in inverted commas, yeah. yeah so. mm. But I think the issue what you're bringing up is the issue of group psychology does change things. So I think if, even if you have a huge mass of personal contacts, say, between Americans and Iranians or whoever and whoever, Nonetheless, there are circumstances, mass circumstances, where all of that gets yeah. it's irrelevant. <laughs> something, again, something else kind of uh, injects itself, so to speak, into the ego that, that simplifies. And some core element takes over. Um, so, I, 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 you know, I like to, I, I'm in favor of art, too, and I love the opera, and I go to <laughs> museums, and, and I... But I, I, I just feel as the, if, hmm? are you changed? Uh, but I, but I do think there is, you know, we're we're still very vulnerable. I mean, I think what holds us together, you know, as a as a uh, productive, respectful collective, is fragile, and I think it's very easily. We're still terror in yeah. terror of the other, is what you're saying. In actual mm -hmm. fact, we have no trust in the other. We have no understanding, no knowledge, no wish for knowledge. Mm -hmm. We have to have a common enemy to feel better. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh. About right. ourselves. Right. And this is the problem. And so I wonder if that will ever change. One of the mechanisms. One of the mechanisms. Well, but I think very that Freud one. is probably very sensitive to the fragility that you're, yes. you're yes. describing. Yes. And I fear that he looks at our recent election and says that for all purposes, you've spent psychologically beyond your means. That is, you used your ego, sense of thought, the reality principle, understanding, comprehension, pragmatic tactics, <coughs> wisdom, to select a splendid candidate but within a certain amount of time, I suspect the old patriarch says, you will be quite angry at him. And the reason that you will be quite angry at him isn't because he makes bad decisions, he'll make decisions as good as anyone else can make, better, but that he gives bad father, right? That he does not supply the satisfactions of either loving the papa or, dare I say, the satisfaction that many liberals and leftists, myself perhaps among them, have had over the last eight years of hating yeah. the Papa vehemently. He creates, rather, or he asks for judgment, thoughtfulness, intelligence, and we are still not grown up enough to give that to a leader. So as excited and as um, kind of grown up as we are right now, um, we're going to be pining for the love-hate thing in a couple of years, and the non inability to give the love-hate thing is going to create all kinds of uh, rancor and uh, resistance. That old standard phrase, the politician you love to hate, may really have something to it. Um, it's, so it's also the ecstasis that certain types of religions provide, which is a dissolving of the ego, actually. And you're saying he runs counter to all that. Yes, ways. yeah. He, he, uh, th this is somebody who asks us to be extraordinarily grown up and to forget some very, or to get beyond some very basic needs for, for love and hate. And we're now on our metal. And Freud wonders, can we do it? And then he hears that we're not British, but Americans. <laughs> <laughs> and then he knows we can't. Right? Yes, because uh, America's so religious. I think that's Freud's problem with America underlying everything. I you think know, that, that is another one. Like, is, yes. Uh, I, I, I don't right. quite understand Delusion what the British... Or whatever. I, I didn't understand that remark. Uh, Freud was um, an Anglophile. Oh. Right, and loved that was a reciprocal uh, yeah and, and was so happy when you know he was loved when he arrived in uh, in in London and celebrated and people sent him flowers and greetings and telegrams and all kinds of expressions of warmth for him but then being Freud this is one of the things I really love about him he knew that if he published Moses and monotheism all the people who had loved him so much would feel a little differently about him but he made sure he got it published and into English before he died, so people could start really getting mad at him again. Yeah, That's he maintained touching. integrity. I think that was yeah. an That's amazingly great. That's great. incredible thing to do. But he did it. He did adore England, and he thought, you know, if ever a country is capable of political maturity, it is England. And I suspect part of it was that the British were smart enough to um, have this place called Buckingham Palace, where all of their fantasies <laughs> about power, authority, and glamour could live with no power whatsoever. <laughs> you well, know? And yes, this was a stroke of, see for the people. This was a stroke of, of utter it, genius, yes. right? Yes. You, could, you, could, you could have all the trappings of group psychology with none of the kind of patriarchs telling you um, what, to, what to do. And our closest approximation, this is a point of um, Camille Paglia, my old teacher, she says what we try to do is to have a kind of relatively sane or maybe Washington and then have Hollywood as our site for fantasies and dreams. The problem is Hollywood just keeps bleeding over into Washington, <laughs> creating all kinds of problems of, of, its, uh, of its own. Mark, if you can now, if you wish, open to the okay. questions. Okay. I wish. Uh, so let us, let's open and have um, a commentary or questions. Or, um, and make them questions. Yes, make them questions. Thank you, Francis. Come to the mic. Anyone has a question? This man's an English psychologist. Looks to be. Well, I've enjoyed the discourse very much, and that's Harold Blum. A part of the uh, discussion of what would Freud say reminds me of uh, John Browning, who has played one of the Mozart piano concertos. I think it was number 20. Uh, and he played it one way, and the orchestra conductor didn't go along with him. 
Yeah, so that uh, they ended up playing in two ways. One was the way the conductor wanted it played. The other one was the way uh, the pianist wanted it played. And they got hundreds of telegrams. And one of them said, the second movement of the Mozart Piano Concerto Number 20 should be played adagio. And it was signed Mozart. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me start from the bottom up historically. Uh, I think that there's quite a history to and complexity to Freud's attitudes towards America. Um, he actually engaged in the analysis of his dreams and Jung's dreams, along with Ferenczi, on the boat as they came over before they reached the shores here. And interestingly enough, when you brought up authority, Jung complained that Freud would not give his associations because he would lose his authority. Uh, this was part of the rift that started to occur, although it was very clear that there were many other reasons and they were bound to eventually part ways. Freud was initially quite pleased to come to America. He felt extremely honored to be given the invitation from Clark University, but he was also jealous that Jung got the invitation concurrently. So he had to share the uh, honorary degree with Jung. Um, on the boat, he was also very pleased that he discovered that one of the still was reading the psychopathology of everyday life. <laughs> and I think that the complexity in Freud's own internal contradictions here are very important. He hated Vienna. He said at one point, I hate Vienna with a positive passion. And it's easy to see if one were climbing, especially that America became the bad object after Vienna, that he displaced his feelings from Vienna, which was incredibly anti-Semitic and opposed to his theories, uh, rejected by academic medicine there and by the academicians and so forth, onto the United States. I think there are also many other reasons. Uh, and later, he was jealous of the uh, fact that Jung and uh, Rank, Adler, and so forth, all achieved some degree of eminence here, all by disparaging and devaluing his theories. Um, in fact, he said to Jung that if you talk about sex even less, you'll be even more popular. <laughs> <laughs> now, about the group. There's just a couple of things I want to say because I'm, everyone, I'm sure, wants to comment. But uh, I think it's important to recognize that Freud was, in a sense, the first group leader. That about 105 years ago, between 1902 and 1908, he ran the Wednesday Night Society. This was the first group of psychoanalysts, the Wednesday Night Group. And he was the group leader. The members of the group would pick from a jar who would speak, and at the end, Freud had the last word. He would always speak last. He also had his own experience then about running a group, and I'm sure this helped him to think of the group. I think one of you mentioned as a family. There was the parent, the leader, there were the children, and so forth. Interestingly enough, in terms of the military, the word infantry contains the word infant, <laughs> which, which brings me to another aspect of, of the groups, which um, wanting to join in this. I think it's important to recognize that the groups can be constructive and promote progression, or they can promote regression <laughs> back to infancy. They can promote de-differentiation and loss of identity, and a person in the group can lose his or her identity entirely and just become caught up in the group, or the group can promote identity, and some people find an identity or a new identity in the group. Uh, so the group has a, a capacity to go both ways. The last point I want to stress, though, in favor of what Freud really fundamentally contributed is that I would definitely support the fact that in the group, the leader plays an extraordinarily important role. And I'll give you just a couple of examples. Last night on TV, I don't know how many of you saw it, there was a program on Jonestown. Uh, and here, over 900 people committed suicide at the behest of a psychotic, homicidal, suicidal leader uh, akin to Hitler and Stalin. Uh, and uh, it is true that as in the authoritarian dictatorial states, eventually there was a reign of terror there. But the lead people went with him all the way to Guyana 
but they were led, they followed the leader, and they adopted the principles, the ethics, the morals of the leader, finally leading to their complete submission to the leader and his uh, perverted uh, psychotic ideas and uh, ideals. In a certain sense, the same thing happened in Nazi Germany. When Masters and Johnson wanted to do their experiments on human sexuality, they thought they would have to hire prostitutes. And lo and behold, under the behest and aegis of medical research, led by the great masters in the hospital, they found that members of the hospital staff were only too willing to volunteer, provided that they were doing medical research. <laughs> so they would perform in front of the cameras and, and the little group there, they would perform all kinds of incredible sex acts that in their ordinary lives they would never have undertaken, though a few of them said sex in the laboratory was much better than at home. <laughs> but here, with a different kind of superego, the collective superego, the hospital of medical research, of the two primary leaders, Masters and Johnson, they were able to engage in behavior that ordinarily would have been considered totally off limits and completely immoral, and think that they were actually doing something that was noble, contributing to medical research. So thank you all very much. <laughs> There's an empty chair here. <laughs> yeah, why don't you sit? I'm sorry. Is that okay? Or? Yeah, sure. Yeah, you comment. All right. Yeah. Uh, is this working? Can yes. you hear me? Yep. Yeah, it's great. Um, I didn't think I'd be talking about Jonestown today since last night was the first time I ever saw any program about it. But I want to take issue with a comment, um, my forgiveness, I <laughs> um, from uh, Dr. Bloom. Uh, it seemed to me that the program last night did not depict people freely choosing suicide at Jonestown. Rather, they were duped into drinking cyanide. They did not know that they were committing suicide. So that's quite different. He was saying die with dignity. He was, he but was this, urging them on to, to yeah. die. But, but you're, you're perfectly right that part of it was that they were terrified and part of it was they were tricked. But they were also told they were going to die. That's true, they and were they told. This, those who had died right in front of them. It, there was a whole, uh, mm. the first hundred were already dead when the next eight hundred mm. were dying. Yeah. But, but there was much less force than with the Nazis, the Nazis or. Yeah, yeah, I guess there was, there was a hope. They, they were not taken by force to a concentration and they had volunteered to go to Guyana that is in true. the first place. Uh, but of course, there were many who did resist committing a suicide, and I think probably a lot of them thought they were drinking Kool Aid. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why I said he was homicidal, too. Yeah, it definitely. Was a murder at the same time as but what I wanted to bring up uh, before the Jonestown came up was um, the thought of that Freud should be used to promote a global talking cure seems to me that's what we need in our international relations. And I think he provided uh, the steps to do so in group psychology and the ego, as well as in other works of his. I don't think that enough has been done in trying to um, talk about the, the Muslim ego, or protects, uh, perhaps in sp specific groups only. I, not to not talking about all of Islam, but it seems to me that psychoanalytic attention should be paid to larger groups today, political groups, than has been. But I, I absolutely agree with you. It seems to me it's, this is a long overdue for us to take our understanding of behavior and sort of and uh, apply it to uh, political, social issues. I do want to take issue, though, with this question about the power of the leader. I think one of the interesting and important things about Freud's work is he didn't really say the leader had that much power. He was looking at what was it that the leader did that got followers to go along with him. The leader, in a sense, does not have that kind of power. It's, a, it's an interaction. It's something that is uh, aroused or stimulated in the individual, in the ego, 
that uh, it's a bond, so to speak, between the leader and the follower that brings that about. And that's the kind of thing that we, I think, need to be more sophisticated mm -hmm. for. But it is a collusion. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I agree totally there's a collusion, but I think it's not just the ego. I think you have to get the id in there. I mean, the experiments, the guy that the experience with, with people um, apparently inflicting pain, if they gave the wrong answer, that was many years ago. Yeah. And they were given permission to do this. Yeah. And I think the same thing, frankly, in Nazi Germany. I mean, it, it, it appealed. There was a tremendous appeal. There was a liberation of all kinds of stuff from the id, if you like, um, that people, why did people, it, and we, we've seen the same thing in other situations. You label, we saw this, we see the same thing with the prisoners at Guantanamo. You label people as outside the system. They are not subject to the Geneva Convention, therefore you can torture them. It's okay. Which is exactly what happened in Nazism. And it seems to me that this is bringing out all kinds of, I would think of as id stuff. I mean, maybe I'm not being sophisticated enough about it. But, you know, we're all, we're all very complicated mechanisms and we're all full of hatreds and suppressed desires and suppressed rages and it can be channeled. So it's much more than the ego, this interaction with the leader. And I think the great thing about Obama, as opposed to Bush, is that he's bringing out, he is appealing to our egos mm -hmm. and our sort of higher selves. And he's trying to quell all the, the hatreds and the divisiveness that Bush is people so beautifully played upon. So, so that's my question, though, is isn't it more than the ego that we're talking about in this interaction? Absolutely. No, I mean, that's... Uh, Right, and I think that what you're also saying is that our racism is often based on the notion that uh, black people have more <coughs> libido, right? They're, they're more impulsive, you know, they're uncontrolled and so forth. So I think there was something very important about his what? demeanor, his control, his, uh, his coolness. That's a good point, yeah. As far as the id, I mean, you could look on the whole country as suffering from what Freud called an id resistance. I mean, how have we tolerated people being incarcerated in Guantanamo as a people? That's the American people that we're trying to educate. And um, uh, you don't read anything like that in the newspaper, that, like, things like you said. That, uh, didn't you send that letter into the New York Times, they'll throw it somewhere. Uh, because uh, this is just the way we do things. We project onto people. These are the bad folks down there. We're good folks. Uh, how we've managed to get all these bad folks in a concentration camp is no different of how the Nazis got the Jews in the concentration camp. And so this goes on merrily because of what Freud would have called resistance from the id. Uh, I was present at Washington Square Park in November when Obama came to speak. And the park had 24,000 people. I got there early with a press pass, so I had a perfect spot to see what was happening. Most of the people were young. Many people from the village were there, and they are activists. They're pretty sharp. They can see through rhetoric and, and all kinds of little ploys. What I think he had was the ability to speak directly to the audience. When he said, I've been here, I know what the village is like, and he named some of the streets, and he looked at these people, they felt that he was one of them. He spoke directly. I don't think they saw him as a leader. I think they saw him as a friend. All of these young people are nervous about Iraq. He did speak beautifully uh, in 2004, it was. And, and their lives are on the line. There hasn't been really an activist movement until he said you can. You can. And he was very straightforward. And he was mesmerizing. He didn't have a marvelous speech. There was no meat in the speech. And when I left, I was uh, per perplexed because I knew that I 
thought he was extraordinary the first time I heard him. And this time I said, how is, how is he going to get it together? A very important person in the village decided to sponsor Obama. I decided to go to the first Obama club that was in the village because I wanted them to do a resolution not to let Mayor Bloomberg destroy Washington Square Park and redesign it because we were going to lose our gathering space by putting grass down and then you can't walk on the grass and you can't protest. It's a whole, I don't want to get into that. Anyway, when I went to the Obama club, it was in some little Ukrainian church on the fifth floor in some community center. <laughs> There were like six people that were bag ladies and two people up at the desk. It was so disorganized and so inarticulate. I said, my God, how are they going to get this together? What we have seen here is a miracle, a beautiful, incredible, exponential growth that Carolyn Kennedy sensed it immediately that he was transformative, that he had it. I don't know that it has to do with father. I don't know that it has to do with ego. I think it has to do with esteem. I think it has to do with promise. I think it has to do with social action plus psychological overtones. And um, what he used, which was a, an important word, which is hope. And I think that it was his time. We're in a different place right now. I believe that Freud would be as perplexed as we are. I think. Well, uh, uh, I don't know. It sounded a little bit spiritual, perhaps. Uh, uh, I really like what you said. But I think it, it, the father can be a friend sometimes. The father, you know, we want that too. And I think the identity, the thing you said about people identifying, well, perhaps, perhaps one does want to, uh, you know, identify with the father figure. I, think it, I don't think it was to do with a spiritual happening or anything. With a what? A spiritual happening. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I didn't hear the lady say that. It was no, no. I saw it was the, the hope feel and the feeling behind it. I don't know. I wasn't here when it happened, and maybe there was really that feeling. But miracles make me nervous. Some, yeah, exactly. Some, yeah. It sounds evangelical. Yes, the miracle. Yeah, no, I mean, that's yeah. what it is, and I'm nervous, very nervous. Uh, right. Right. Well, I, I'm struck by the word mesmerizing in, in what you said because it reminded me that uh, Thomas Mann wrote this novella based since very much on Freud's book uh, called Mario and the, the Mario the right. Magician. Yeah. And in the, in the novella, Mario is a very talented magician who mesmerizes yeah. crowds <laughs> and great. unleashes you know, the power of destructiveness by, by, by virtue of that. So I think the whole notion well, of well, process and mesmerizing, in a sense, is very, you know, is very much yeah. to, to the point here. Mm. Uh, my guess is what's mesmer. So I'm trying to make the point that there's something about allowing oneself or submitting to being mesmerized. It's not just that the leader does, but that the 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 subject of hypnosis allows yeah. to have sure. happen or wants to have happen as well. That it's, again, it's a collusion. It's a two-way mm. street, and I think there's something about. What Obama does is he makes us feel better about ourselves. <laughs> that we can feel better as Americans because we've done this. So my name is Kitty, and as an Obama volunteer, I really want to ask for, with all of your understanding of groups, for practical advice. Because <laughs> there is the wonderful, you know, all across the country, uh, more or less army of volunteers who work for Obama. And how can this, how can Obama um, use your understanding of groups to convert all those volunteers to uh, the next cause, the next uh, national service, or the next good. And your advice about how to convert that group into a continuing action group and not let it just fade away. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make one comment. I share everyone's enthusiasm about it. Can I just make one comment before the answer? Um, uh, the comment is this. Uh, I think we're all inspired by, by Obama, et cetera. But I want to point out that 46% of the United States population, voting population did not vote for Obama. His real strength was in mobilizing the youth, who were very much supportive, and, and getting out the black vote. He did not win a majority of white men or women. Democrats never do. That is true, but he was no different in this respect. This was not a sea change. People did not really change. He had a different electorate. 
Well, well actually, your, your question or your statement dovetails into hers because she wants to know what do we do about this 46%. And um, I'd like to do what I call one of my 180 degree turns that my wife says makes me unreliable. And say art is a good place to start. Because I considered what was done on YouTube and the things that came over that I considered high art that got into the public realm and that they made a big difference. I mean, that was one place to start. And the other thing is with your immense database and with your, I mean, I go with Obama's good sense. Um, and just, you have this, you have a terrific opportunity now. And, um, and I think you are, you're asking just the right question. Um, just the right question. Anyone else wants to back on that? I just want to say one should be, um, uh, there is one, I want to say, a hopeful thing, a pessimistic thing, and tell me straight. The hopeful thing is there has been one other comparable political figure, and that was Nelson Mandela. And that does show the power that a wise, wise, I don't want to idealize it, but that somebody who is actually morally sensible and who doesn't play the game of splitting and uh, projection uh, can do. But then he won't give people what they want. No, well, uh, but there's a lot of people he won't give what he wants. You take away the millenarian impulse. That, that's, that's, what, that's what the, that leads to this second thing. Well, I'm going to take another order then. We shouldn't be also, we get a sense of how much hold on us these forces have if we think about the fact that psychoanalysis itself has been victim to them. Psychoanalysts from the beginning understood group dynamics better than the public of the world ever will. And they had destructive vision after destructive vision after destructive vision. Uh, so it's not, it isn't just knowledge that's going to help. Uh, but finally, we can see the, the forces that Obama will be under and something th that may or may not be ominous in his response to them, which came out in the campaign with the uh, uh, the military action in Georgia. So Obama at first put out a very sensible statement because, uh, um, as I'm, I'm sure you know, uh, the uh, Georgian leader attacked uh, Russian troops that had been in situ for many years. It was a, a piece of nasty uh, and foolish aggression, uh, which, and Obama uh, basically was very even-handed in his initial statement. But here, it caught the old us-them hook of anti-Soviet rhetoric. And uh, uh, McCain and Palin immediately made it a point against Obama that he had uh, been as critical of our friend, uh, who's, who, for God's sake, his campaign Seth manager Lesher. was, uh, Shakespeare's campaign manager was, uh, um, uh, a lobbyist for as our enemy. And immediately that changed the public sense of it and Obama had to back down and start being ferocious about Russia when he couldn't have believed it for a moment. Hmm. Uh, so the pressure he's under is this pressure of a national mood where we've located the enemy and we can now kill him uh, or we must now stand up to him. Sarah Palin was actually willing to go to war with Russia over this, or express <laughs> that willingness. Uh, but but Obama, Obama was highly plastic on that very vital point. Now, he had an election to win. That's right. But, but uh, that's the kind of pressure he's going to be under. And that's the kind of pressure that his supporters can do their best service by insulating and protecting him from. Um, yeah, my name is Isaac Schlechter. I just want to bring uh, something that has been absent from, from the group and the, the talking, which I think is the circumstances. The circumstances is very, very important. We're talking about the leader, the psychoanalytical sense, but the circumstances is different. The problem, in, according to all the surveys, go along like every week, is the economy collapses. So in the, in the, the reality that we all 
really retirement, all the things are there and it's collapsed. It's worth even now, you know, some sometimes half or a quarter of, of the value. So that is a big circumstance in which will favor the opposition. Uh, and he was smart by comparing McCain to the president, and this is going to be four more years. So the circumstance is very important. Mm -hmm. And I am glad that you mentioned about Freud, your grandfather, about that like he said that anti-Semitism is up to the Christian. I disagree. I think that anti-Semitism or any hate has to be responded by the people that being hate, like that, the black. That, that, that part was obvious, but the unobvious part, that the uh, protester should be the other too. That's why he wanted Jung. He wanted Jung because he was Christian. So if psychoanalysis could be condemned yes. as a Jewish science, but, then but, it wouldn't be a science at all. I, I, I understood in, in what you regard. meant. But remember what the many Jewish people said, never again, meaning they are willing to, to do. And with anti-Semitism, we have like 2,000 years, you know, the Christian church and others saying that the Jews killed Christ and all that. So make the circumstances. He just took that, Hitler, and and was able to do all the killing, all the sins. So we have to remember, I mean, going back to the, the important thing, also the circumstances. Yes, yes. I mean, after yes. all, the Christians were thrown to the lions, remember? You know, by the Romans. I mean, these things are cyclical. And in time, your point is fantastic. In times of recession, or any trauma in the economy, yeah. in the society, that's when governments, they make coalitions, they make real democracies, they come together, have proportional representation, they really start yeah. to listen to each other. And I think for this reason, it's a good point. That is Thank one you. of the reasons why you flipped from Bush to Obama, you know. Yeah, that, that has to be. It's time of crisis. We have some questions that have come. I'm fine. No, I thought the papers you had, I thought maybe they had questions that had been given no, I, I have a thought on this last man's remarks about circumstances. That, I mean, I'm sure there are many, I'm not going to say anything that many people in the room wouldn't say, oh, sure, sure, we understood that. But the economic circumstances, in my judgment, made it possible for Obama to get the election. And that's why Freud would have said, you guys were really lucky. And as far as luck, I mean, we're things are random. Anything can happen out there. And this was, in my judgment, not the hand of God, but a random circumstance. And that circumstance made it possible for the American people to get the answer to that question that so perplexed them for reasons that are... I, I, perplexing to me. Who is this man? We don't understand him. We don't know who he was. I mean, these are just code words for, we know who he is, he's another nigger. And this is how, and then, when this economic circumstance came, and he stood, he stood there, and McCain stood here, people said, hey, he's like Michael Jordan. He's like Tiger Woods. He's like Louis Armstrong. I don't know what the hell they said to themselves. But he became, he became some other person in their mind. And they got, over, they got over their inhibition to pull a lever for a black man. And that's how I saw. And, and, and we lucked out. Uh, that's the way I see it anyway. Thank you. Thank you so much. Further information about our programs and a complete archive of past Philip Tate's events is available at philiptates.org. <laughs>